Hello and welcome to the CHDS Master's Thesis Series. Today I'm here with Matt Heckard. Matt is the Assistant Director for Preparedness at the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. He's here today to talk about his thesis covering emergency preparedness for nuclear power plants. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Scott. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you arrived at uh, your topic. So I actually got the idea for my topic uh, from my first time here at CHDS about three years ago. Um, I was a participant in the Radiological Emergency Preparedness Executive Program that they sponsor here on campus. And in talking with some of the members of the cohort, uh, we discovered that there's an increasing challenge with the Radiological Emergency Preparedness Program for commercial nuclear power plants in the United States. And in managing that program and in ensuring that it keeps up with the latest emergency management and preparedness doctrine uh, that's spreading across the country uh, and is becoming a part of state and local programs in every state where there's a nuclear power plant. So one of the things that uh, we did was that after the, the session had ended, uh, we went back to work and uh, I worked with FEMA and also with the NRC to some extent uh, to try to tease out uh, what we could do to attack the problem and try to figure out uh, what our options were uh, with regards to the way the program is today and to continue to protect public health and safety, but to do so in a more efficient manner. So uh, as you got into the thesis process, talk to me about some of the methodologies that you were using in your research. Sure. Uh, the first thing I did is I had to figure out what I was going to measure. Uh, in order for this to be something that would be viable, um, I had to figure out a way to measure different programmatic and different policy options that could be used for this type of thing. Uh, measuring preparedness is notoriously something that's very difficult. Uh, but fortunately, uh, with some of the technical sides of nuclear and radiological emergency preparedness, there was an opportunity to leverage some existing work that had been done by the Environmental Protection Agency as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, and look at what we can actually do to understand the risk that nuclear power plants pose to the community and how to measure that risk in terms of its magnitude um, and in terms of its probability. And so there was some work done by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, in using probabilistic risk analysis and in using performance indicators to try to measure the performance of a program over time. And I thought that that would be a useful concept uh, for us to use, not just in measuring on-site or inside the fence, but in measuring off-site programs and how they are complementary to the programs that are going on that are run by the utility at the plant itself. So what were some of your research findings then? Well, surprisingly, uh, one of the first things that I found based on the research is that the emergency management and preparedness doctrine that's put forth by the National Preparedness System, this is something that was really generated out of Presidential Policy Directive 8 in 2011. President Obama directed that the nation become uh, more prepared and that it do so in a systemic manner and that it implement the same protocol across the nation uh, for all state and local jurisdictions to use together uh, to build preparedness in a unified manner. Um, I had originally thought that that would be a good avenue to try to integrate the REP concepts and the different planning standards that we use for radiological emergency preparedness with that methodology. And the research revealed that that really wasn't the best option. Um, and so in looking at different options, uh, potentially eliminating the REP program and looking at the cost savings, uh, but then trying to find a way to account for how we were going to prepare for the hazard was another option. Uh, but there was too much uncertainty as to how we would continue to preserve the integrity of making sure that we had a standardized, unified methodology to uh, address this across the country. We have to do that not just from a government standpoint, but from an industry standpoint. Uh, they uh, require us to look at and account for the cost of these programs and if we have variations in cost depending upon where it's implemented or what state, uh, then that creates difficulties for them. So we were really left with looking at um, some of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's uh, approaches and some of the ways that they measure risk and incorporating those into the existing program to make it better. And the research really showed that that was the most efficient and most effective option, uh, both from a risk perspective but also from a cost perspective. Uh, that we could use to improve what we already have, 
to maintain the integrity of the program as it's been implemented today and to continue to effectively protect public health and safety while doing so in a more efficient manner. So would you say as you went through the process, is there anything that came back as a surprise to you in terms of your results and findings? There was. Uh, we did, I did do some research and try to figure out what the risk basis for a nuclear power plant accident really was and where it derived from. And some of the information that I found seemed to indicate that the levels at which we consider radiation to be a harm to human health uh, were somewhat arbitrary, and it was very difficult to find the root of where those were based in science. And so in going back and doing additional research on that risk basis, um, I discovered that most of the limits that have been set for radiation exposure actually come from a desire to establish a consistent regulatory basis, and they're not necessarily rooted in hard science or in evidence uh, for something like this, which is really a stochastic type risk. It's not something where we can attribute causes of, say, cancer uh, in a population to specifically the radiation that comes out of the power plant. So we needed to find a way to um, understand where the current regulatory basis came from and the planning basis. And that was a really surprising finding that some of this had derived from a National Academy of Sciences genetics panel study that was performed in the 1950s. And out of that study, it was uh, advertised that there was a consensus of those scientists that something called a linear uh, no-threshold uh, uh, dose-response model was actually the most effective way to uh, set regulatory standards and to understand the impact of radiation on human health. And that panel was, in fact, not in agreement that that was uh, the best way to approach it. But it was advertised that that was a unified um, a unanimous conclusion. So it sounds like kind of a, a combination of misinformation and archaic uh, uh, data. Right. Uh, whatever the cause, um, it was clear that there was no uh, real scientific grounds for some of the arbitrary levels of what we consider to be the basis for the risk. Interesting. Yeah, and so would you say that uh, uh, it was sort of fear-driven um, historically? It was fear-driven. Uh, at the time, we were in the middle of the Cold War. Um, the United States was very concerned with proliferation of nuclear weapons. They were very concerned with the effects of nuclear weapons or the potential for nuclear war. And I think that we um, had a lot of messaging and efforts um, in our government to try to ensure that people uh, remained aware of those risks from the Soviet Union at the time. And those carried forth into our peaceful purposes of nuclear power, our peaceful purposes of nuclear technology, such as for nuclear power. And they've never really shaken um, that, that, that specter of fear. And so what we end up now with a situation where we have um, established levels and limits and restrictions uh, around how we regulate nuclear power that are the most stringent out of any industry. And they are also um, out of proportion to the actual risk that we can prove from a scientific mm -hmm. basis. All right, so uh, now you have this information that's specific to your sort of jurisdictional area. Do you feel like uh, it has broader implications to homeland security in general? I do. Um, this seems a narrow topic, but one of the things that is emerging in our field in emergency management and homeland security is the need to work with the private sector. And the methodology that I use for this thesis really highlights the importance of understanding the cost piece of how we implement policy and how we run programs. This program is a joint program. It's a joint effort between government and private sector who runs the nuclear utility. And so it has to be aware and conscious of the cost, and it has to be aware and conscious of the efficiency level um, of what we're doing and how much resources we're expending and what the risk basis is that provides the evidence for that. Uh, as we continue to work with the private sector and government, we're going to need to continue to look at our government programs and benchmark them against these same types of standards and same types of considerations. So this perhaps provides us a way to start doing that. Um, and it's something that could be extended to other programs as well, uh, for not only for critical infrastructure, um, but for other types of issues that exist within the Homeland Security or Emergency Management sphere. Great. Well, Matt Hecker, thank you so much for your research. Thanks for coming in today to talk to us. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it.